And we're live. It says we're live again. It's been a while since I've seen that you are live. But uh, I'm glad to be back here with you again, Matthew. Uh, I think we were the last episode uh, before we had a little vacation break. And we're back. And we're here with something very important to everybody out there. What are we talking about today? Today we're going to be talking about the three most important budworm moths to deal with in cannabis. Essentially, we'll be talking about uh, the corn earworm, the cotton bollworm, and the tobacco budworm moths. Right, and that's some good stuff. Before we jump into that, though, how is your summer starting off? Are you busy? Are there a lot of uh, pest infestations you're already seeing? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and this is a very good pest to talk about at this time because budworms are already established, um, you know, since the beginning of spring, depending where you are in the world. Um, but yeah, this these hotter months are when the spider mice and the flea beetles and the moths of various kinds, um, they're all becoming much more uh, active, aphids too, for that matter. So... Uh, this is definitely the time that I get the most um, sort of clientele, people asking questions. Um, so I'm very excited to be helping as many people as possible, both professionally and personally. Well, good thing. And I know you helped me a lot. I have something eating my Japanese maple. I don't know. But if I can find it, I'll send you a picture. <laughs> Please do. Yes. Well, before that, uh, well... Let's get to the presentation, if you like. Are you ready for... Uh, oh, wait. Looks like we've got to pull that up on the other screen here. I, I may have a little bit of what they call ring rust when it comes to uh, running the show, but that's okay, because uh, nobody's in a hurry here. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everybody. I kind of see you filing into chat. And everybody who watches these on the replay, don't forget, we do have a playlist, the Xenthanol IPM series. Uh, you can go and catch some of these other insects that he's mentioned, the aphids, the spider mites, a lot in there. And we'll be adding the budworm to it today. Um, so are you able to send that my way or to let it into the screen, Matthew? Oh, it should be that way already, is it not? Okay, no, it was there for a moment, and then it disappeared while we were talking. I took my eyes off the prize, so let's <laughs> see if we get that. Get the presentation back up in there. I've already had a little bit of a sneak preview. But those of you who have watched these series, you kind of know what to expect as far as the presentation format goes. They're comprehensive. They give you the information that you need. And I also love the fact that he kind of keeps things color-coded because that helps my brain categorize everything. So, all right, there we go. We've got it up. Let me bring it to full screen and uh, take it away. Well, thanks, Chad. So today we're going to be talking about budworm moths. Um, there are many different kinds of budworm moths out there. So with cannabis being what it is, it's a little bit difficult to know which ones are going to be the most relevant or even which ones are relevant at all. Um, we already know some information, so I'll be going over some of the empirical research that's already come out about it as a cannabis pest in particular, and also some of the information regarding bedworms in general that we can use to extrapolate a bit. So to start off, I want to talk about what we're going to be talking about. So we'll be mainly talking about the corn earworm, Helicoverpa zia, and also a few others in the Heliothini, which is the sort of group that a lot of these budworms are in. We'll go a little bit over the evolution of these moths and how they became such a terrible blight on our crops. Uh, we'll go over some of the difficulties with identifying them and why in a lot of cases it might be impossible or at least very difficult to tell the difference between at least larvae together. Um, but you can rely on experts to be able to help you there. And also, of course, how to mitigate them, how to prevent them, and also how to treat them. Uh, physical barriers, microbial biocontrols, and also the importance of seasonal trapping. And as you can see here in the picture, we have a uh, corn earworm moth larva feeding on a bud of cannabis. You can see at the top sort of the burrowing area <laughs> Uh, where it went in and the damage that it causes. You can see an adult at the bottom left and what one of the eggs looks like, of course, much larger than you would see in nature. And on the right, you can see some of the various uh, different colors and shapes that the uh, corn earworm larvae come in. Mm -hmm. 
a little bit about myself. I'm Matthew Gates. I'm an integrated pest management specialist. I've been doing this for 12 years now. And mostly at this point, I've been working in cannabis, but I've also worked in ornamentals like Gerber's and roses, as well as vegetables like peppers and tomatoes and even certain orchard crops too, for that matter. If you don't already know, I have a YouTube channel for science communication regarding agricultural pests and their biocontrols and things like this on my Xenthanol YouTube channel. So you should check that out if you're interested. You can also find me and a lot of the research that I talk about on my Twitter and Instagram social media, and that's at Sync Angel. Some publications that I've done recently include my uh, chapter that I contributed to for the IPM against arthropod pests, so like insects and mites of cannabis sativa in the United States of America, and also a chapter I contributed to in another book for uh, viruses in cannabis. So we talked about viral diseases in cannabis there. I also recently um, worked on an article for Skunk Magazine. I'm a, I'm a regular uh, contributing author there. Um, the summer 22 issue will be talking about various good bad and neutral um, organisms in cannabis in particular. Also for high times, I made a, um, an article, an online article about the six common cannabis pests that you have to worry about. Also keeping in the theme of um, it being very hot and things getting much more difficult as far as pests are concerned. And also I had a really great interview with Jason at uh, Curious, Curious About Cannabis, the podcast episode 71, Insect-Plant Relationships from a Genomic and Molecular Perspective. We get to talk about heady concepts about ecology, how all the various organisms interact, plants, insects, mites, and all this sort of thing, and uh, how you can understand how these symbioses occur. So budworm is a name with many meanings. Um, again, the subfamily Heliothini is the uh, group that we're going to be mainly talking about, which is nested in the family Noctuidae. Noctuids are known as owlet moths, um, and they are very well known for feeding on the reproductive tissues like budding flowers. So that's why they're called budworms. And again, there's three species we'll be talking about mainly. The corn ear worm, which is established in mostly North America and South America. The cotton bullworm, Helicoverpa armigera, which established in Eurasia, Africa, Oceania, Sahul, which is the continent that Australia is on, and South America, as well as, apparently, Florida and the USA a little bit, which is very, very problematic, and we'll learn about why. We'll also be talking about the tobacco budworm moth, Chloridia virescens, which is mainly established in North America. Um, so one important thing to talk about, I think up front is that, uh, these species, at least the first two, uh, the corn earworm and the cotton bollworm are two species in the same genera, the same genus rather. And that means that those species are very closely related and they can actually interbreed, which is a problem because they're very, very resistant to various pesticides and also plant defense compounds and things like this. And by interbreeding, they're able to pass a lot of those strengths onto their progeny, which can, again, be very problematic for farmers. Also, it should be well known that the cotton bollworm in particular is an uh, incredibly destructive pest in various parts of the world. And it's expected that annually across Eurasia, it damages or results in the damage of five billion dollars USD annually, right? And if it gets into North America, it could risk as much as $78 billion in agricultural damage, which is a gargantuan number to even think about. And it's also considered to be highly likely in the future. And again, for those who aren't aware, uh, eloquently put out, some of these points are highlighted or colored. And you can see that I have um, my references in the same color usually. So if you're interested in certain statements and where those come from, these are coming from usually research reports or other sorts of um, official documentation and things like that. So I'm not just pulling it out of the air. This is uh, definitely something people have been talking about for a long time. And of course, cannabis is going to be under threat as well. So it's something to be considering whether you're a home grower or a commercial grower. Um, it's also important to note that budworms are recognized as quarantine pests which are pests that if you find them in um, 
uh, transport, agricultural transport, uh, those products can be destroyed potentially or otherwise held so that they don't go and become established in another location for people who are trying to keep that from happening. And this is something that various countries have um, agreements with various other countries about. And certainly it's also true even um, between the different provinces or states in your own country. So like the United States for, uh, for a matter. And yeah, so it's just a very important pest to consider as cannabis becomes more and more accepted as it, and as it becomes more and more established as a crop, uh, these sorts of regulations are probably going to become more important. And if you think they're not important to you simply because you're not a commercial grower, um, the law will still apply to you in a lot of cases. And uh, you don't really want to be allowing these budworms to get to other people that you care about, of course. So there's a, a lot of reasons why you want to keep these things uh, controlled. As always, I like to talk a little bit about the evolution and biology of the organism that I'm talking about here. So we're talking about moths. And if you didn't know, uh, all butterflies are actually moths. So the Lepidotera, which is the order of insects that moths are a part of, means scale wing. And they diverge from a common ancestor with another group called the caddisflies, which some people might know, especially if you are an angler, because their larvae are often used as bait. And the scientific name for this group are the trichotera, or the hair wings. Um, many people in the audience probably already know that trichome means hair, or trich means hair. So these are the hair wings and the scale wings, and they diverge from a common ancestor like more than 250 million years ago. So a long, long, long time ago. And I guess it's also important to, to point out here that uh, these moth larvae have been feeding on plants for an extremely long period of time. Um, they predate flowering plants, actually, and they co-evolved with them extensively, and they've influenced the growth of various flowering plants to that end. Um, the very first moths, as you can kind of see in this first diagram on the left, uh, they actually had, you can't see in the diagram, but they had mouth parts much like their larvae do, uh, chewing mouth parts. And all the other moths since then, including butterflies, have a proboscis that they coil that they used to drink nectar from. So it wasn't always this way, but they developed this over time. And so this co-evolution with flowering plants is, as you can see, very important because it is exactly those nectaries that the uh, mouth part is being used to, um, to feed on them, right? And looking at it even more grander, um, most people know moths and butterflies, they have a larval form, a pupa form, and an adult form. And they share this with their uh, close relatives, the wasps, bees, and ants, as well as beetles. So they're all part of a, a major group that all diverge from a common ancestor that way. And to drive that point home, um, you can see on the left and the right, these are what are called phylogenetic trees. These are essentially um, uh, lineages, descendants, essentially. Um, and you can see here that on the left here, there's this, air, there's this group called the glossata at the bottom left. And those are all of the moths and butterflies with coiled proboscises. And everything before them did not have that. You can also see in the center area here, um, three representative groups. The first group at the top here these are the Deutero flel, uh, flebiidae. Now, this is an extremely primitive fly group. Most people who have encountered flies know them, or at least they're maggots, as kind of featureless with no legs or anything like that. So you might find it difficult to believe that they share a common ancestor. But the most primitive flies had these fleshy legs that you can kind of see at the top here. Also at the center, you have primitive wasps, sawflies. If you've ever played Pokemon, you might know the Pokemon Weedle. And this is actually the inspiration for that because it is a um, very caterpillar looking larva of the Symphyta, which are the sawflies. And um, as you can see, they look very much like caterpillars, but they are in the group of wasps, which then became bees and ants. And at the bottom, you have a picture of a uh, Helicoverpa larva. And again, you can see that they have these sort of the same kind of legs, two different kinds of legs at the top and the bottom, and also a head capsule as well. 
more on this coevolution. So um, in this diagram, you have a dark green semicircle, which is the flowering plant evolution or divergence. Um, you can see all the different, this is the phylogenetic tree I was talking about here. So this is a, a very, uh, very extensive um, showing of the very, uh, the different families and groups and things like this and how they've developed. And on the right, you have this sort of purple semicircle. Those are the Lepidodera, or Lepidodera, those are the moths, of course. And this blue ring are when bats are thought to have developed early in the Paleogene. And for a long time, people thought that moths developed um, their ability to hear biosonar or the echolocation of bats because of because of that. And it's true that they did evolve to have that ability, but they evolved ear-like organs um, that allow them to hear, and only certain groups have this, way before bats actually diverge, or develop, I should say. Um, and that's significant because uh, it's important for us to know how these moths actually really developed and what was really the influence for them growing up. And, and truly, truly, it was the flowering plants that they were feeding on. Uh, these red nodes here show that when they develop those hearing organs and the orange um, uh, group are the butterflies. Now, of course, butterflies we know because they're active at day, but of course, moths are active at nighttime. And it's thought that one of the ways that some groups of entrepreneuring moths got away from bats uh, was because they, they essentially just decided to be active at daytime. <laughs> Decide is a strong word, but they developed to be this way. And that is uh, very important for them to escape that sort of predation. And this circle, this like lime green circle in the, in the middle, that is kind of hard to describe, but essentially it's supposed to represent the early flowering plant groups as they uh, fanned out. And so as you can see here from the diagram, once I've explained all of it, that flowering plants and moths basically uh, developed at very close to the same time in the evolutionary time scale. So again, they have been together like very, very closely. A little bit more about these caterpillars. So caterpillar morphology is interesting. At the bottom right, we can see some of the examples of structures you should be familiar with. They have a head capsule at the top. So um, that's going to be sort of a hard structure. Many people have seen this, that they've seen caterpillars at all. They have these first six legs, which are the thoracic legs. Many people might know that insects have a head, a thorax middle, and an abdomen at the bottom or at the, the uh, posterior end. And so the same thing is actually true for caterpillars. They have these legs at what that location would be like. And then they have these things called prolegs at the end, which they use to grip onto the plant or whatever other surface they're on so they can move along very well. And at the very tail end, they have what are called anal prolegs, which are close to the end of their body. And so this structure will allow you to know what the caterpillars kind of look like. You have a scanning electron microscope in, uh, image at the center here, uh, which is not very attractive, but it sort of shows some of the uh, different parts of the body. And the larger diagram at the upper right kind of shows some of these uh, details. Don't worry, they won't be on the test or anything like that. Um, but you can kind of use this as a reference point in case you are curious. And I have an appreciation for caterpillars, um, although they uh, are kind of dopey in a way because they can't see very well. They have uh, very primitive eyes, things like that. Uh, believe it or not, many caterpillars actually can perceive light through opsins or proteins that are uh, photoreactive, which we also have in our own eyes, and they detect light, right? And so these are actually in their skin. And for some caterpillars, it actually allows them to change color over time because they're literally seeing the light in their skin, which I think is incredibly fascinating and a, um, a fun fact that people should know more of. Uh, their movement is articulated by their thoracic legs and at the front of the body, and then they have those gripping prolegs at the end of the body, right? And they also have spinnerets that they um, they have near their mouth, and they use that to produce silk so that they can escape predation, make silk drag lines, or also uh, cocoon themselves as well. And also important to note is how they feed. Of course, as a cultivator, you have to know 
uh, why is this caterpillar so successful? Well, one of the reasons why, and if you've been watching these videos uh, in this series, you'll you'll find a common theme, and that common theme is that herbivores will destroy the plant immune system so that it's not a problem in the first place. Uh, they'll either suppress it or they will modify it in some way. And in this case, what they do is they use a combination of behavioral adaptations, like maybe they mostly feed on the young tissues, or maybe they only feed on the old tissues or something like this, or they, in our case, they burrow into the plant. Uh, they have salival proteins, and they have a gut pH that is actually uh, basic. It's not acidic. And that helps to uh, basically um, destroy or sort of neutralize some of the toxins and other sorts of reactive compounds made by plants in defense. And this also affects the microbiota that are in their gut as well. A little bit more about morphology and moving more towards the uh, species that we're going to be talking about here. Uh, we have an example of the cotton bollworm larvae. Um, so Halika verpa larvae look kind of very similar um, when they're younger, and they start to look a little bit different as they age, but they can still be very difficult. The upper right shows the first few stages, and the bottom left shows the latter stages, and at the very bottom we have what those pupil shelters look like. Um, when the larvae get large enough after they've eaten their fill, they will burrow into the ground, and they will pupate, and the pupa is this central um, picture here, you can kind of see parts of the moth before it comes out, right? You have the large abdomen, uh, you have the wings that you can kind of see. They're, they're kind of wrapped around the front of the body. You can see where the eyes are going to be at the top as well. And so, yeah, if you see a pupa like this, um, it might not be Helica verpa, but it might be a noctuid or another sorts of owlet moth. Uh, but yeah, many people have come across these and not really known what they are. And it's very difficult to speculate on what it will be until it kind of encloses or hashes out. You can also see that a lot of these larvae tend to have what are called um, pinacula, which are these sort of like black dots that often have like either small little fine hairs next to them, which you won't really be able to see very well, or like larger hairs that kind of poke out. This is especially obvious when they are larger. And you can also see that they often have these sort of lateral bands of color. But again, they can be very different and disparate. And so you can't really know just because it's green or brown or some other color that you know exactly what species it's going to be. But you can actually know a little bit about whether or not it's like a noctuid or some other kind of caterpillar. So if you see something that looks like this and it's in your bud, it's probably a budworm of some kind. And a little bit more about the evolutionary history, a little, a little bit more. The Noctuids are actually the largest species of, or largest group of moths that exist. And there's over 365 species of these heliothene moths as well. So these are often referred to as the pest clade or the pest group. And as you can see, uh, they mainly eat herbaceous plants, many of which we feed on as crops. And why is all this important? Uh, you might be asking yourself, and this is a fair question. I bring this up because the, um, as I've written here, ancestral outlet moths, they derive from groups that ate mostly woody plants, but also herbaceous plants, so like trees and things like that, as well as like, you know, like mints and, and uh, sort of like uh, more pliable plants, grasses as well. And they mainly fed on the Eurosid one plants, which is a large group of plants, ancestors of things like nettle, mulberry, beech trees, buckthorn, legumes, roses, and gourds. And they also fed while exposed to the environment. So burrowing into the bud is actually a derived trait that they grew, that they developed later on. And this is very important though, because the urticaceae, which nettle are from, and the moraceae, which mulberries are from, are actually the families that are most closely related to the cannabaceae, which are the which is the cannabis family, right? And so that means that these groups or things that feed on these groups are more likely, probably, to feed on the cannabaceae and possibly cannabis than other groups that feed on other plants, if that makes sense. And um, if you're curious, you can read here about the. Uh, ancestral cotton, uh, cotton bullworm 
moth and how it basically uh, developed a very robust array of uh, mitigating traits for plant defenses. And over time, actually, uh, through dispersal to other places like North America, the corn earworm actually developed from this lineage itself. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, they have many, many, many genes related to detoxification and digestion and all that good stuff. On the right, we have a diagram that shows some of the poorer or more favorable host. This is specifically for uh, Helicoverpa armigera. And yes, you can see um, the diagram shows the development time to the fourth instar, which is before they pupate, and also the weight that they have. So the implication is that plants that they develop lower weight on and take more time to develop on are poor because those plants are, they, they are successfully um, uh, interfering with their ability to digest food. They are interfering with their ability to gain weight, which is, of course, going to have a major effect on their ability to develop if they develop at all. So you can see Arabidopsis, which is the thaocress, tobacco, tomato a little bit, capsicum, which are peppers. You know, they, they have more of a difficulty. They can still survive, but they have more of a difficulty on these plants. Of course, the laboratory diet wasn't even plant food or plants, so um, they didn't have to contend with any toxins or anything like that. Uh, but other sorts of plants are a little bit more favorable in that way. So we also already have another species of moth, the salt marsh moth, which is um, already known on cannabis, although it's not really a major pest or anything like that. That's part of the Arabid uh, <laughs> sorry, the Arabidae uh, family. And as you can see in this phylogenetic tree in the center, they're somewhat close to the noctuids, which are those owlet moths we were already talking about. On the right diagram, uh, we have this Heliothis group. Now, this di this diagram was developed when uh, before there was a change in the genus name. So I've gone ahead and done that already here. What we knew here as Heliothis virusins is now Chloridia, which is the tobacco budworm moth. And all these green highlighter or highlighted uh, species are the ones that we want to really consider the most here. And I asked you two questions as cultivators that you have to consider. The first one is that perhaps there are other related species that feed on cannabis besides the ones I'm talking about here, and we might discover that in the future, but also perhaps there are species that are adapted to close relatives of cannabis like I already mentioned here. And there's this hypothesis about how that kind of comes about, that through dispersal or other sorts of means, which often happens in agricultural trade, these populations get into a new location and they actually do very well because they're free from the parasites and predators and other sorts of things that were a lot more adapted to them in particular. So it's a really important thing to consider. These things are always constantly changing. Um, yeah, so like I said earlier, they use salivary glands and the fat bodies in their body to detoxify the plant toxins. And again, we'll go into that a little bit more. On the right here, you can see a diagram of the various budworms that we're concerned with, cotton bullworm, corn earworm, tobacco budworm, which are all very closely related as well. Although the tobacco budworm is a little bit less related than the other two. Um, on the right here, on the upper right, this is also like a phylogenetic tree, but this is depicting um, in, uh, I believe this is from Brazil in particular, that uh, different species are interbreeding. And this is significant because those species that interbreed can pass resistance genes and other environmental resistance traits and things like this that they've developed over time in their new location to older populations. And it becomes a really big problem for cultivators. And Brazil in particular and other parts of South America are being hit very hard. So if you grow cannabis in these locations as well as North America, you really need to keep an eye out for these. Um, and uh, yeah, some of the main hosts of these heliothene moths are daisies and mints and figworts, if you're familiar with that group, flocks as well, and the solanaceae, which are the nightshades like tomato and tobacco and things like that. At the bottom right here, we can see a, um, a depiction of uh, cotton bullworm and also corn earworm moth adults. 
as you can see, they look very, very similar to each other. So it can be very difficult to tell the difference between them visually. And um, in case you ever have to do this, I wanted to do a brief little explanation about um, this diagram here. This shows different genes that are related to the detoxification I was talking about. And don't worry, it's not as complicated as you think. Um, basically, if we take the first row example here, this gene uh, S2D, uh, the very top here, or the very left here, if we go down this vertical row, we can see that um, it's most highly expressed in these fat bodies. Just in case you were curious what I was talking about here, um, this is the site for insect detoxification oftentimes. Uh, they're very different from us in this way. Um, they have a little bit of a different physiology, right? And you can see that as it's lighter blue, uh, these this gene in particular is much more expressed in those fat bodies, whereas it's less expressed in certain other parts of the body. Um, so, and you can also see at the bottom row here, that's like green and pink, those two color changes. This also shows how these genes actually change depending on what plants the larvae are on. So you can see that's actually very radically different. The gene gets much more expressed on things like cotton and Arabidopsis or tobacco than it is on, um, uh, the more green colored ones like green bean and tomato and things like that. And that's because they have different toxins in them and the plant and the, the insect has to radically change how it expresses its genes in order to have a good day and be able to feed on those healthy, healthy plants. So the first one, the most important one, the corn earworm, Halika verbazia, it's distributed mainly in North America and also in South America and Central America, as you can see in this map. Um, they feed on over 100 plant species, including things like maize or corn, sorghum, cotton, beans, peas, chickpeas, tomatoes, aubergines or eggplants, peppers, clover, uh, okra, cabbage, cucurbits like your uh, cucumbers and things like that, tobaccos and sunflowers and various other plants. They can move an extraordinary dif uh, distance. They can move as much as 750 kilometers, which I think is over 500 miles if I'm doing my mental math correctly. And they've been charted or they've been tracked from places like Texas to Arkansas. And um, international migration from Central America to Northern USA is highly supported. So again, sometimes these populations go to some parts of the world, they develop all these great, neat, um, you know, uh, beneficial resistance traits, and then they'll travel all the way into North America, and we get left with an even worse pest to deal with. And this happens year to year, multiple generations per year. Um, adults are mainly active around April, and then they'll migrate distances at a height of about 30 meters. And they mostly rely on weather patterns for, for their ability to move great distances as well. They can't power their flight all the way. Um, a lot of that is uh, gliding or at least using the wind to make their wing beats a little bit more efficient. Biology of the corn earworm is pretty normal for caterpillars. Um, they start off as a small white egg. As you can see in the upper right here, this is a depiction of those eggs being laid directly on the flower. And good luck trying to find those when you're scouting. So scouting for eggs is really not um, ideal or practicable, honestly. Uh, it's the larvae that are more likely that you'll be able to find. Of course, unfortunately, the problem is that a small larvae right after they hatch they almost immediately burrow into the bud. So you might not even see them even if this happens. But what you will see is a result of the damage. And the bottom left here, you can see um, what in my experience is a pretty unique example of these budworm moths moving through the corn earworm in particular here, the stem of a cannabis plant. Um, I don't really experience this personally, but I'm really happy that um, people are doing research on these in this particular crop and they are finding these interesting experiences that other people don't necessarily have. Definitely enriches me and all of you now that we're having this presentation. As pupa, they, again, as, as late stage larvae, they will move into the ground and they burrow several centimeters and then they kind of stay there and they create their pupa and they kind of overwinter like this. Um, in many parts of the United States and also certain other parts of Eurasia, 
they are not necessarily very good at overwintering. They will die um, because it just gets too cold for them. And generally, this is considered to be the case um, uh, that they can survive south of the 40 degree latitude line. But because of climate change and things getting warmer generally, this range is increasing. So you should probably expect that to change the next 10 to 20 years. Then we have the cotton bollworm, Helicoverpa armigera. Its distribution is much more widespread. And so for my um, you know, more international audience here, this is going to be perhaps more relevant to you. So whether you're in Africa or South America or parts of Eurasia or even Australia, uh, these things are everywhere. And especially in places like South America, they've become a big, big, big problem, like the haplotype HARM1. Uh, basically, the trend goes this way. European populations established and moved into the Caribbean. And then genetic diversity through genome sequencing, we've been able to find uh, lineages that stretch from Africa, Asia, and European populations. And we already know that uh, populations that have resistance genes to things like pyrethroids and similar chemistries are already developed. Then they moved into places like Puerto Rico in 2014, and also again into Florida in 2015, and now we are in 2022. And it's still uh, sort of contentious about whether um, it's gonna spread more uh, into North America. Like I mentioned earlier though, this actually already happened, and that's how we got the corn earworm, which is very well suited and situated in North America. So you have to imagine that is probably likely, and perhaps even more likely, because there's all these humans transporting plants, it will probably make this more likely to happen. Um, it's incredibly important, I want to put here, uh, that if you're going to try to treat these moths and their larvae, um, to be responsible, you have to know what you're using, and you also have to know whether or not your target is going to be resistant to the things that you're using, whether they're microbes or chemicals. And I've heard it often said, it's very pernicious, uh, that uh, pests can't get resistant to being eaten or biocontrols or infections. And that is um, not true. That is a straight up lie. And we will go over this later on. So keep tuned. The life cycle is very similar to what I already described, but this picture uh, eloquently sort of describes it. You have eggs that become very small larvae. Those larvae will grow a little bit larger and then a little bit larger and then a little bit much larger and they go and become a pupa and then they close as an adult. Again, $3 billion USD annual is the uh, conservative estimate for damage of these moth pests. They're, they're incredibly difficult to deal with. And uh, if you grow cannabis in proximity to places that grow things like cotton or tomato or corn or chickpeas, um, you know, this is probably likely going to be a major battle for you because they are major pests of these crops. And like their brethren, again, they do burrow into the flower material very soon after they hatch. So you really can't expect to see them or detect them. Uh, even if you scout every day. And this also shelters them from contact killing uh, botanical insecticides that you might rely on as being a safer alternative to other noxious compounds, as well as even sort of biocontrol agents that you would normally use. And just to give you an example of how, uh, how well they can spread, um, if you thought the cotton, if you thought the corn earworm was pretty good with 750 kilometers, these moths have been um, tracked moving as far as 2,000 kilometers. That is, that is just amazing to consider. <laughs> um, and they reproduce very, very fecund. Um, maybe an average for some research, 413 eggs per female. But um, averages of over 1,000 eggs have been documented. And these can have generations of four to six per year. So that's 6,000 eggs per year. And maybe even if you account for some of those dying off or whatever, um, there's still a pretty radical amount. Um, they feed these ones, at least the cotton bollworm, they feed on various plants, but they're most concentrated in groups like the daisies or the asteraceae, the fabies, the fabaceae and the malvaceae, like the mallow. 
plants. Also, again, the Solanaceae, the Fabaceae, and the Poaceae. Solanaceae is tomatoes and tobacco, and Poaceae are the grasses. And again, uh, this harm one haplotype is important to consider because um, it's been found in Brazil and Central America. And so this lineage that is uh, resistant to various uh, pesticides and plant compounds and, and is very, very good at what it does, um, it has been found established in South America and Central America um, already. And um, there's a few reasons for this. And it could also be because our treatment regime, uh, sorry, regimen for other budworm moths may be influencing this moth because we're actually killing the ones that would normally compete with it. If you can call it a competition, it's certainly uh, all competition for the cultivator. And so this could be a reason why they're uh, kind of becoming more and more out of hand. They also have a greater repertoire of resistances for um, uh, environmental problems, but also, like I've already said multiple times, pesticides and uh, plant defenses. And now we've gone to the tobacco budworm, which is Chloridia virescens. Like the other two that I've already mentioned, they have many, many known hosts, and their primary crop hosts are things like tobacco and cotton and tomato, but also things like tobacco or alfalfa or clover, which probably will influence what plants you want to grow around your cannabis if you're growing any around them at all. Also, if you have cover crops and things like this, um, another thing to really to consider is whether or not you really want to use those near your cannabis because you might be facilitating this moth. There's also many other hosts. So remember that tobacco budworm is mainly in North America, Central America, and South America. Um, and there are hosts that it developed on way before we brought crops from other locations into here, but they've adapted very well to them. But I have a list of other known hosts on the right here. I'm not going to say them all, of course, but many of them are very popular ornamental plants. It might be plants that people living near you might be growing as well. So if you know these plants, um, you can kind of be aware that they could be a potential host and vector for these moths and their larvae. Unlike the other two, however, you can see that the wing pattern of the tobacco budworm moth is a little bit different. It has a sort of like horizontal three stripes per outer wing. Um, and that makes them a little bit different from the other moths that we had already talked about earlier. So you can perhaps tell these two apart. And there's a bunch of other factors that people use to identify them. Uh, these people are taxonomic specialists, however, and so you shouldn't really expect yourself to be able to tell the difference or even have the equipment necessary to do so. But I bring it up here uh, in case people are curious, if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, uh, this particular research report was looking at the difference between uh, tobacco budworm moth and I think cotton bollworm moth. Yes, that was the case. Um, so there was like differences in their mandibles. Um, there's differences in these microspines on these panacula that I was talking about earlier. And there's differences, like I said already, about the, the wing morphology and uh, more importantly, sort of the wing patterning on their bodies. Now, these diagrams are from a paper that didn't have any color. Um, so I tried as best as I could to sort of represent them here. Um, but yeah, if you're interested, you could take a look at the research reports and learn more about them. Interesting thing to note, though, is that they um, there's a preference where females that are raised on certain hosts will lay eggs on those species. So if there's already tobacco budworm that's gone and become affectionate for cannabis, then it's possible that we already have some of these populations floating around doing that. They're mostly active at nighttime. Um for tobacco budworms, and this is probably true for other budworms. They are, of course, most active at night, but the females especially are spending a lot of their time using pheromones um, and calling males in order to mate and then lay eggs very soon after. Um, they spend relatively short periods of time foraging or even laying eggs. So a lot of their time is really just spent like, you know, harnessing their energy and uh, just pumping out pheromones. And these are two of those pheromones here for those who are curious or are chemically minded. It's also important to know this for using pheromone traps. So 
there the behavior of budworm larvae is sort of generalizable, like I've already kind of said. Um, cannibalism is actually kind of common here. And if you're curious to know more, I have a video on my YouTube channel here. I'm going to skip through it a little bit to show you um, what they kind of look like. So you can even see an example of a larva attacking another larva because they're in close proximity and they even compete with each other. You can see the panacula that I was talking about earlier, uh, the sort of black spots, how the larva is sort of undulating here on my thumb um, and moving its body around to sort of find, uh, in a vain attempt to find uh, uh, plant matter that it could feed on. So they kind of move in that direction here. And then I also wanted to show an example of the drag line that I mentioned earlier. So if they're disturbed or if they're moved, they might be able to deploy a silk lifeline and that might save them from predation. And then they can kind of wind the silk up in their legs and they can continue on as they were. I also want to talk a little bit about Caterpillars using a relative, which are the Spodotera or the army worms. Um, here in this video, you can kind of see how they feed. In case you've never actually seen these caterpillars feeding. Um, and I also like this video in particular because um, it sort of shows how the larvae can become very damaging very quickly. So. The first stage only eats about 14 millimeters squared of tissue. The second stage eats 84. The third stage eats 154, which I have now articulated as golf balls of surface area to give you an example of something that you might know. And then the fourth stage, it goes from three to four, 0.4 golf balls to 1.6. That's many times more. Uh, four to five, you now have 5.7 golf balls of surface area. And then five to six, you now have gone to 27 golf balls of surface area of mammolithic 10,808 millimeters squared. And then, of course, after that, they go to pupae. So this is important because what will often happen is that a large population of these larvae will get uh, deposited in your crop. And you'll see basically no damage, no damage, no damage for like uh, maybe a week or two. And then all of a sudden you see massive damage because all of them kind of simultaneously in synchronicity um, move from like three to four or four to five or whatever that life stage is. And then they they decimate because they, they um, all simultaneously need a bunch more food in order to um, metamorphize. So that's just an important character trait when it comes to caterpillars. Yeah. They have a foregut, a midgut, and a hindgut, like most um, insects. And they have this little structure called a, like other insects have, a paratrophic membrane, which is what keeps baddies out, like uh, pathogens and uh, plant toxins and things like that from getting into the hemocele, which is basically the bag of guts and blood that um, caterpillars and other insects have to contend with. And when they excrete, they excrete waste out of the rectum like other animals and also out of these special structures called malphigian tubes, which is basically their analog for um, nitrogenous waste, like for us urine. Um, just briefly going over again, when caterpillars and other insects feed on plants, it causes all of these different stress changes in the plants that you're cultivating. Uh, Hamps are herbivore um, associated molecular patterns. They have now been called things like damps or damage associated molecular patterns and things like that, if you see this in literature. So they cause things like uh, cascades and signaling. Um, you know, reactive oxygen species are produced and osmotic stress occurs, and fluxes and ions and things like this. These all result in changes in genetic expression at the cellular level in the plant. And this also signals to other cells that they should also produce similar sorts of defense uh, responses. Uh, but insects have been feeding on plants for a very long time. And so what will happen is that these, uh, these compounds Maybe they're things like defensins, which might interfere with the ability for the insect to break starch down into free sugars, which then gets into their hemocyl, and they use this as power. 
um, just like we do with, with carbohydrates. Uh, maybe they are things like peptidases or lectins or other sorts of things like that that will interfere with protein digestion and breaking apart into amino acids, which are then um, put into the fat bodies and are then further detoxified. So there are various things that plants do have, and it's a it's an arms war between the insect physiology and its microbiota and the plant physiology and its microbiota. And so uh, what will happen is that um, different targets of those toxins might change as the uh, insect evolves over time. This is very common, and you especially see it with pesticides, but you also see it with plant toxins. So um, those the toxins come in with the food. The toxins then maybe make it past the paratrophic membrane for whatever reason, and then they might affect a critical component of their physiology. But they also might become modified in that process by the by the insect physiology, and then it gets sequestered. Many of you know of monarch butterflies, and this is an example of that, where the toxins in milkweed are then used and sequestered into defense compounds. So if you've ever been told that uh, insects lack the enzymes or the ability to break down defenses and things like that, uh, this is patently false, and there's many, much literature on the subject to refute that. Um, a lot of this happens, again, detoxification in the fat bodies, or it's just simply transported out with the waste. Now I'm going to talk about some of the examples of treatment for these budworms. Buvaria is one of my favorite uh, pathogens ever for insects, and I've, been, I've taken the saying MSOC, or more spores on contact, which equals increased lethality. This is generally true not only for Buvaria, which is an entomopathogenic or a parasitic fungus of insects, but also true for other things like bacillus and other bacteria and things like that. And um, yeah, so there's various ways, as you can see on the right, that this occurs. And again, you can check this short video out on my YouTube channel um, if you're curious to learn more about how that process happens. But as you can see in the diagram, the concentration of spores is uh, directly uh, related to the mortality percent. Uh, for the larvae. Bacillus thuringiensis is the same way. Higher concentration is going to be more efficacious. Lower concentration is less effective. So in all cases, um, coverage is incredibly important to consider. Uh, fun fact, Bacillus thuringiensis is closely related to Bacillus anthracis, which is where anthrax comes from, and also Bacillus cereus, which is a human pathogen. So if you thought good guys are all good guys, um, they're, they're uh, a little bit more complicated than that. It doesn't mean that this will damage you or hurt you or anything like that, but you should know that these various microbiota, um, they have a very interesting uh, family. Let's just put it that way. Budworms have actually shown resistance to the toxins of Bt, uh, which are called crytoxins or cryproteins or um, crystals even, protein crystals. And if you've ever wondered why it's called thuringiensis, which is a weird word, that's because it was um, first described in Thuringia, Germany. And that is why that happened. And funny enough, when they did document it, it actually became a rampant pathogen and moved right through the um, Institute for Serial Processing afterwards because it was killing all of the bugs they were researching. You might have actually wondered, how does BT work? I've encountered people in professional capacities and just uh, personal capacities that are very dubious about uh, these toxins. Like, are they going to damage me? Are they going to be a problem for my health? And I think that's an important question to ask. Um, so there's two ways that this happens for insects, and they don't really affect us in this way, um, generally speaking. So these cryproteins will either bind with um, receptors on the cells of the intestinal gut lining of these caterpillars. And what happens is that they get into the, the gut. And if the, again, if the pH of the gut was not basic, it was acidic, these proteins might not um, uh, solubilize in the way that they are expected to. So these toxins are very, very species specific. They're very, very insect specific. So they, go, they come in with the ingested food material. Um, they become activated. The toxins sort of change their structure um, due to the pH of the gut and other, other factors um, that come in and sort of modify them. 
And then they sort of come around and they come to this coherent point, for example, and they produce this pore. And this pore essentially is like a, a needle hole. And many a times this happens in the cell and it basically ruptures the cell and destroys it. This is great for the bacillus because then it can feed on the juicy contents of the cell and then reproduce. And then the other thing that happens is that these toxins come into the cells. Instead of making pores, they create a signal cascade. Uh, they basically trick the cell into exploiting its um, programmed cell death. So many cells have this uh, capability. It's very important, especially for viruses. And so they exploit this viral defense by making the cells kill themselves over a bacteria. And those are the two main ways that cryproteins work essentially. But the, you have to understand that this is a small segment of many, 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 many other sorts of proteins that are being produced by not only BT, but also other pathogens. Like I've put here SIP, VIP, site, surface layer, and parasporin. Um, very other, various other proteins are used in, um, in concession. And if you're curious, these are models of what the cry proteins look like. And at the bottom left here, we have talk, we, we can see actually um, I believe this is a scanning electron microscope. Oh no, it's an optical microscope. My apologies of a um, of these various cry proteins, and they're they're referred to as toxin crystals because of their structure. This is a microbial biocontrol recommendation by Crenshaw, uh, who wrote uh, the proposed management plan for corn earworm and hemp in 2018. So I'm going to talk to you about that here. There are as quoted in the research, two strains of this bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis, Kurstaki, and Aizawi, that have been commercialized. And they say that the Aizawi strain tends to be more effective against the cutworm group of caterpillars, which I believe he is referring to outlet moths here. Um, there's also a virus, which is called Helicoverpa armigera nucleopolyhedrosis virus, or sorry, polyhedrovirus. And that infects corn earworm and also related species. So these are two microbes that you could use, the Bacillus thuringiensis aizawi and the, uh, what I'm gonna call here, NPV virus. And they say here that these microbial insecticides have several desirable features. They're extremely low toxicity and uh, hazard to humans and other vertebrates. So they have very low effect against us and things like us. Uh, they're also very selective and they won't affect other insects, which is also incredibly important if you're trying to be responsible and regenerative and not trying to kill everything in sight, which I certainly am an advocate for. Um, they can only kill caterpillars, so that's really important. Immature stages, they won't kill the adult stages of other things that we want to conserve, like various butterflies. And um, they can all, but see, they can only kill caterpillars that chew on the parts of the plant that have the particles on them, which is, might be a little bit of a detriment, which means that some damage has to occur in order for the microbe to have the effect that you want to have. There's also nematodes, what are called entomopathogenic or predatory nematodes. Um, there are various kinds. The ones that are often used for this species are the Steiner nema. Uh, species like Styronema felsiae or what people know as SF nematodes, but there are other ones out there as well. And kind of a fun fact, in the upper right, we have this diagram that shows that um, when, see, when nematodes get into their host, they excrete um, bacteria that actually do the killing of the host. And the bacteria produce compounds that kill the insect, but they're also uh, pro, uh, compounds that affect other nematode species. So they can't come around on this already established larva and sort of get a free meal. And so some of these nematicidal compounds or factors here uh, can actually be negatively effective against um, plant pathogenic nematodes, PPNs, as we see in the diagram here. And that's actually kind of beneficial because some people do deal with these root knot nematodes and other sorts of things. So if you've been dealing with those, you might consider uh, killing two birds with one stone or indeed two pests with one nematode. So again, like I said here, Stanonema felsiae, Stanonema carpocapsi, and Stanonema rio brave uh, are known to have greater than or equal to 70% suppression 
of corn earworm in field conditions. And it also goes after other things we've talked about, either myself or, or us here on the Zentanil IPM um, series, which I have two videos for, you can see in the bottom left here, for Western flower thrips and also for leaf miners, uh, but also corn earworm and fungus gnats as well. So that's an interesting thing to consider. You can kind of kill multiple pests with one beneficial. On to the virus. I know a lot of people are going to have questions about the use of a uh, virus to kill pests. Of course, that might be a little bit contentious, especially nowadays. So I'll go a little bit about this. They are part of a group called the alpha baculoviruses. They're about 80 to 180 kilobases in size, which is kind of small. They're made of about 90 to 180 genes, and they're about 30 to 70 nanometers in diameter and about 2 to 400 nanometers in length. And the diagram here, you can see a model at the top, and also you can see on the right side the um, what they look like under a scanning electron microscope. Um, you can also see the little uh, uh, structures that they use to fuse with the cells of the of the insect itself. And here's a bunch of examples of what these look like. I mainly want to bring this up just to let you know that uh, the way that it works. In simplified terms, that the 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 virus uh, makes contact with the cell, with the protein spikes, it fuses with the cell. Uh, their DNA comes out, double strand DNA. It becomes recognized by the host cell as just regular old DNA. It converts that DNA into what's called messenger RNA, or mRNA, and that's sort of a transitory space. And so that also then becomes translated again. Uh, and, or that becomes um, that becomes used to make uh, various amino uh, sorry nucleotides and proteins therein, and so the reason why it works so well is that the cell can't tell the difference between its own DNA and the DNA of this virus, and so that's why mortality is often very very high. But you should also know that um, you know microbes, not just viruses. They can be very genetically diverse, and just because we have populations that we apply from commercial uh, products and things like this doesn't mean that they can't then interact with naturally occurring viruses or microbes of their same groups, and possibly in some cases others. Um, and so you just want to be responsible. You want to not over spray. You want to not over apply. You want to be very um, conservative with your applications. Um, I've written here, can pests become resistant to biocontrols? Absolutely. And this uh, this research report shows an example of this. Um, natural or human strains of biocontrols can affect the environment. And, you know, the dynamics can change unpredictably. So, again, if you're being a responsible cultivator, then you should really know what you're applying and how it affects the uh, local environment that you're growing in. Again, from Whitney Crenshaw, we have this sort of suggested pest management plan for the corn earworm, which is also probably generalizable to the other two. Establish a way to monitor flights of the corn earworm moths. Begin this by late July or early August, which is very, very punctual here. This is being reported in June. So this is a great opportunity for you to get your budworm strategies in line. If you have any questions, again, I am available in a professional capacity for those who need it. And I'm also producing various presentations and videos on the subject. And I'm happy to help you out if you have any questions. Um, you can constantly monitor and maintain the trap if you create a, if you get a pheromone trap, which you should definitely apply. And you should record captures twice a week. You should be fastidious about this and really track when they become really active. Uh, if large numbers are caught, that indicates, of course, that more eggs will be laid. And so then you should be applying the things that will kill the larvae to come afterwards. Again, BT insecticides containing the Ayazawi strain are recommended, but Kirstaki strain products will also work as well to some degree. Spray should apply in a way that provides good coverage on the developing buds. Now that's what they're saying here. I personally agree with this idea, but you've got to be careful with what you're applying, especially on the flower material. To be honest, I'm somewhat reticent to myself unless I really know what I'm applying and there aren't any weird inert ingredients or things like this to consider. I would like to see a little bit more research on that personally. And again, treatments can probably be safely discontinued about two weeks before harvest, so says Crenshaw. However, some caterpillars may continue to develop in green moist buds 
after harvest. So you should have some quality control there, you know, checking your buds if you're a home grower or a commercial operator um, because they might continue to grow uh, on the plants and you might have even less product than you thought you had before. There are also various parasitic wasps that you can use and flies for that matter. Uh, some of them are commercially available, but many, many, many of them are uh, just naturally occurring. There's, it's a very likely that some exist near where you are because these wasps are some of the most speciose insects in existence. Um, I also want to mention the sort of um, wording. So parasitoid, what does that mean? It means that it's parasite-like. So usually parasites don't, as a matter of course, kill their host, but a parasitoid does. So the wasp, it will colonize the, in this case, larval caterpillar, and the larvae will kill the host as a part of their normal life cycle. Some parasites kill their host, but that's not typical. And so you wouldn't call that a parasitoid. It might be killed from a um, confluence of many factors, maybe stress and environment and parasite. Then you have things called hyperparasitoids. That means above parasitoid. So those are parasitoids that parasitize other parasites. And those also exist as well. And wouldn't you know it, some of those are also wasps. So although it's not talked about a lot, uh, if you're having trouble reigning in control with the parasitoid wasps that you might have bought, part of that is because they're only one part of a, um, of a complex integrated pest management approach, but also because you might be suffering from parasitic wasps that will actually seek out and destroy the ones that you've already applied that are living in your uh, pests, which is um, worrying, but it is something you should be aware of. Uh, chemical resistances. I already mentioned that we'd be talking about this later on, and we are at that point. Uh, fun fact, um, especially for cotton bollworm, and this is also uh, less true, but still somewhat true for the other ones, uh, they are resistant to the cryoproteins in Bt. They are resistant to all chemical classes that are known in pesticides, which is extensive. That includes things like, you know, DDT, pyrethroids, spinosin, carbamates, organophosphates, things that you don't want to be applying on uh, your cannabis in particular anyways, especially those latter two and the first one. But, you know, um, that's just something that you got to be aware of. Again, these are incredibly resistant um, insects. I have said this at least 10 times already because I really want you to, to appreciate um, how much they can overmatch the plant immune response. Your loud is loud to budworm moth antennae. What I mean by this is that uh, even if your compounds have defensive effects, they can still be very attractive to the, to the insect itself. And sometimes they even use these compounds themselves for various physiological functions. Um, uh, at the right here, I have a list of different compounds that also I've seen um, found in cannabis that might be good for, um, or, or might be important for uh, cannabis because they might be volatiles that attract the budworms. Um, so then again, just a, a thing to consider. So you have things like alpha pinene, beta pinene, beta myrcene, uh, linalool, limonene. These are also very common. Alpha farnesine, right? Beta caryophyllene, borneol, so uh, and methyl salicylate at the bottom here. People might ask if oxidative stress can significantly harm budworms. Probably not. It seems to be the conclusion. Um, so, like things that might rely on oxidative stress, like uh, you know pH to water or something like this. Um, this is very unlikely to have the intended effect that you want, not only on budworms, but also the adults, because they adapted pretty well to uh, UV radiation and other things that produce uh, oxidative stress in their cells. But despite their resistance, there are some things that you might be able to use. This was a uh, research, this is from a research report that um, looked at plant extracts, and uh, neem tree extracts seem to do very well in the studies. And they uh, are documented having a repellent or even an antifeedant or ovicidal effect. So it kills eggs, prevents them from feeding, and even repels them from the plant. Uh, but again, you have to be aware that sometimes neem tree extracts might come with other compounds in them because they were raised and then applied with pesticides themselves. That does happen sometimes. So just know your source and be aware of that possibility. Um, the substance has to make physical contact with the egg or larva. 
And if individuals are burrowed, even if you have a suitable extract, well, you might not be able to get the, um, the effect at all. So uh, a lot of times people to counteract this, they'll apply multiple times. But again, you have to leverage that with how much you want to be applying on your flower material. And of course, for the breeders, I had to make a slide about resistance breeding. I scoured a bunch of research literature about what other crops do to counteract the budworm moths for resistance. And there are a few examples. Now, I want to say this about resistance, though. Um, resistance is not the quality of repelling parasites, which is called antizoonosis. That's very uncommon, somewhat rare, especially on a plant that's already a suitable host, generally speaking. Resistance is the ability for a plant to yield and produce and be basically unaffected by the colonization of the, of the insect. It's not the total repellence of the, of the insect itself. That's an important concept to know when we're talking about resistance breeding. Um, so a few examples, uh, physically tougher fruit in tomatoes reduces penetration by larvae. So in this case, maybe the um, physically tougher uh, leaf material, perhaps using things like silica, other sorts of things that make the cells and the tissues just more robust and rough and tough might uh, uh, make it more difficult, especially for these younger larvae, um, you know, to, it makes them have to work harder essentially, which might uh, put more strain on their body and might make them more likely to fail at their task essentially. And apparently smooth leaves and cotton are less attractive for oviposition than hairy leaves. So if you have a less trichomous foliage, which is usually not what you want in cannabis, but it's possible that this might have some effect on oviposition or egg laying. And there are various uh, compounds that are found in plants that have been negatively, or, or rather I should say antagonistic to the budworms. So we have oxidative enzymes like peroxidases and lipoxidate, uh, lipoxygenases. We have polyphenol oxidase in tomatoes um, and cotton. And like I already said earlier, oxidation is a common cellular defense uh, in, for certain insects and also of certain insects. Some insects actually use uh, oxidative uh, species, many of them do. In fact, our own body does for a uh, defense against pathogens and things like that. Terpenoids like pinenes and trans beta osamine were noted for being uh, resistant or related to resistance in various plants. And you got things like tannins and phenols uh, like chlorogenic acid, caffeic and cumeric or fer uh, yeah, ferulic acids, which were found in chickpea and cotton to be associated with resistance. And then we come to a very interesting part here. Um, uh, uh, PATS is a uh, Dutch group that is looking to use drones and sensor equipment to uh, both locate, uh, detect, locate, track, and then eventually kill um, pests. It's a new uh, product. I didn't talk with anyone. This is not an ad or anything like that. But um, I found it very interesting, and I've um, cutely called this slide Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance IPM, or Integrated Pest Management. Here's the first video I have uh, from Pats. You can see the drone is lifting off. Um, it's moving in the air. It is banking. Moth detected. Moth destroyed. The um, picture was a little bit odd there. Here you have the IR sensing system. Again, drone comes up and eviscerates the moth. Uh, again, like I said, I'm not totally sure on the camera angles there. I'd like to see it in person or something like that. Not saying it doesn't work, um, but it would be interesting to see uh, some, some more footage. Of course, uh, this doesn't mean that you rely totally on this system because that would be absurd, anyone who would make that point. Uh, but it can be a supplement for regular crop scouting, especially since moths are most active at nighttime when you're not scouting and you don't want to be turning your lights on during lights off, right? So because they can move over a thousand kilometers and they have all these uh, traits that make them hard to detect, you might really want to do this. Now, here's the really beautiful system or aspect that I find very interesting. This is mouth, this is moth counts per day. Um, you can see that these uh, various rates are being tracked on a dashboard. They even have moth counts per hour, which I think was really, really cool. And you can see here on the screen that um, between 2,100 hours and about 400 hours, or rather maybe like 1,200 hours, is when they were most active. 
Um, so that's just really incredible. You can actually track literally which hours of the nighttime uh, that they were most effective at, which is really, really cool. Um, and then you have here um, their velocity and the duration of flight being tracked. Um, so again, this is using an infrared sensor in order to um, track the flight. This is a three-dimensional model of, the, of a moth moving in space. Uh, and, and here is the uh, night vision of that movement. I think it's thermal or, again, IR tracking here. So you can see the moths literally moving across the crop. And it's important because you could you would be able to tell um, this moth maybe from a different moth, or you could tell a moth target from something that might have tra been tracked by the IR system, uh, but maybe isn't actually a moth, potentially. Um, so, so very important to have that kind of information. I think this is really fascinating. It might be a little bit niche, uh, but as this kind of technology becomes democratized, it might be a good way to help people, especially people who might have uh, disabilities or difficulty for other various reasons uh, in life, um, not being able to track at nighttime. So to sum up, we have three biological examples of control. We have bacteria, fungi, and viral. We have various cultural practices, pheromone traps or infrared sensors to track seasonal presence, screen barriers to prevent overposition on plants, eliminating larval presence. So uh, mesh screens are incredibly effective and useful for various pests, and I'm a big advocate for using them because they only cost once, essentially, and then if you do it right, you have a really uh, um, sort of well-positioned barrier. Much easier to do in home grow than is in others, but again, important to consider. You have monitoring and culling of non-crop host plants, so destroying plants that could be a vector for this moth, and also, in some cases, people will recommend pupae busting tillage, but uh, in research, it shows that it's very low effect and, of course, it has major disadvantages like with the facilitation of soil erosion. So you don't really want to do that. Again, IR sensors and aerial vehicle interception is on the horizon. And that is the presentation. <laughs> Holy cow. That was awesome. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, thanks everybody in chat. Definitely get your questions in. I will be asking them now of the expert. I've got a whole notebook page worth of questions for you, but I'm still kind of in shock of that killer drone taking out the moth. The, the AI there is, is fascinating. Uh, was that something that they developed in the um, Dutch uh, greenhouses? Yeah, it seems like that's the case. To be honest, I don't know a whole lot about it um, but because it's so new, uh, but it's very interesting. I find it very, very fascinating, and I think it has a lot of use for people. Um, I was surprised that some people were making comments like uh, uh, when I shared it on my, on my Instagram, people were saying like, oh, you could, just, you could just scout. I mean, yeah, of course, but like these are at nighttime. <laughs> You know, like you probably have other things that you're doing, like sleeping or anything else. And again, with cannabis in particular, you can't just go into the crop when it's dark, you know, so. Yeah, that's a, oh, sorry. I'm trying to pause. I'm trying to find that video again so I can play it full screen. Uh, it just started talking in my ear too. But um, yeah, moving at nighttime. See, that was a big question for me because I mentioned at the top of this, my Japanese maple, you know, I see the pupa on there. I see them kind of silking down. I'm just like, why? Where do you come from? How do you show up year after year when there's no vegetation? And all of a sudden, the second we get a little vegetation, there you are. I never good see timing. anything flying. Yeah. Good timing for them, not for me. <laughs> right. So that that was one thing, um, but yeah, the Pats was that the name of the system? P A T S. The, yeah, that's uh, the killer drone. Oh yeah, there's the Pats C and the Pats X. The Pats X is the so Pats is the company. Um, Pats X is the like drone hunter killer system, kinetic interceptor, however you want to call it, um, okay. and the Pats C system is just the sensor. I think that's how I understand it to be. If I'm wrong and you work at Pat's, please leave a comment <laughs> and tell us more about it. 
Okay, yeah, wow, I see a bunch of cool videos here now. Uh, it was kind of funny uh, in, in chat, someone had made the comment too. It's like, you need a big vacuum drone to follow behind it because it decimated <laughs> it decimated that moth to drop it right back down into uh, into your crop. So I don't know if that's yeah. added protein or what. <laughs> so, some people, I think people made a really good point that if you have a very um, large amount of moths, which is very likely, like I said, thousands of eggs, right? So even if a fraction of them go to adulthood and you have a, a drone going around slicing and dicing you might get a ton of scales and bug guts so probably more relevant for things like ornamental flowers and vegetables and less so for like maybe cannabis where you have to smoke it at the end you can't really easily wash it off but maybe you could deploy it around your greenhouse potentially if you're creative but yeah it's a very important thing to consider it is indeed and here let's 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 uh i'm gonna pull up this video here hopefully we don't uh i don't think we'll get dinged for it but we'll, we'll play this video and see what pats is talking about just because again i i can't get to this list of questions until my mind is done being blown by this <laughs> thing so let me add this to the screen go yeah. over here go full screen with you hop back oh no i gotta hit play over there okay hit introducing play extremely small drones that hunt flying insects can Take you hear moths, this chat? for example which you may know from your backyard you audio as a pest they are also a major cause of crop losses in greenhouses once a moth enters the greenhouse that it finds itself in moth heaven here they can easily <laughs> reproduce oh, no. as there are no natural predators and the use of insecticides is not a preferred solution Nature Ooh. solves insect overpopulation by slowly evolving natural predators. Using this as an inspiration and enabled by recent advancements in drone technology, Bats developed an artificial predator that intercepts moths midair. Just like nature, we built them fast and small. So small that they're safe around humans. And so fast, even cats look surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Our system monitors and controls moth populations in greenhouses. Plagues are kept in check while the ecological balance is sustained. The drones never sleep and are always ready for action. They'll stay inside so that we don't impact the natural environment. The autonomous bat system controls pests so that the grower can rest assured. We protect your crops and provide sustainable insect control as a service. Pats. Our drones never sleep. Wow, and you see the size of that greenhouse right there too. Yes, you would probably need multiple systems, I think. Yeah, I, uh, oh, don't buy another bottle of bug spray before. Let me close this. Okay, close the window. Um, <laughs> yeah, taking the train around the Netherlands. There were so many times where I was like, oh, I should get my camera out. You would just pass like it seemingly miles or kilometers oh, of yeah. greenhouses there just nothing but greenhouses as far as the eye can see it was pretty awesome uh and i definitely did hear a little bit of dutch english there it was kind of funny i'm yeah getting used as to they it say, as they say if you ain't dutch you ain't much which is a uh i don't know if i always agree with that but the dutch are incredibly proficient agriculturalists in my opinion so Believe it or not, my grandpa had that bumper sticker on his van. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> good. Just in touch. <laughs> yep. Um, okay. Well, cool. Thank you for sharing that little bit with us because that is kind of mind blowing. Also, again, it showed the automation and the level that automation can get to and will get to being able to detect, hunt, and destroy something as small as that in such a large area. So that's cool. Yeah, I think so. And um, I think that it's totally, you know, it's reconcilable with people who want to grow, you know, organically and that sort of a thing. Just because it is technology doesn't mean you have to be a Luddite or a primitivist uh, necessarily. And again, I want to harp on the idea that like um, automation is important for people who are older, people who might have an injury, you know, people who grow cannabis for medicine potentially. So like, there are, and also, you don't have to use the drone. You can just use the sensor system and see what was happening while you were asleep, too. So, 
that's an interesting aspect of it as well. Always, you know, more data. Some of us just love data and that would be fun to have. Um, you, you mentioned kind of, you know, a lot of people do like the organic side and approach these days, a regenerative uh, style these days. BT is something that we definitely hear in that conversation a lot. But one thing that we've always heard is never spray your flowers. Right. Budworm uh, is really an issue when you have buds. So really the time you would be applying this would be when there's buds. Is this something that uh, kind of has been accepted as a practice or is quote unquote safe to do in flower? According to uh, Whitney Crenshaw in his research, um, it seems well, that's what he recommends. And um, he's a very learned person very highly respected entomologist, in my opinion. Um, at least I respect him quite a bit. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, but like, I mean, I make the point that like with certain products, you don't always know what's, go what's going in there. So, I mean, right. I'm still kind of reticent. And I think a lot of people have that sort of squick factor too. Um, you know, even if the product, I mean, even if the product actually doesn't have very much other sort of inert qualities or anything like that, uh, you know, maybe something changes and a, a, a material data sheet doesn't get updated or something like that. And, you know, things can happen. And so, but like with biocontrols, if there's not a whole lot of things that you would add to it, I feel like it's generally accepted by a lot of people. But uh, this is also kind of a new paradigm, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean... It's difficult because whether you use a chemical agent or a microbial biocontrol, the problem is um, getting it on target. So even if you do apply it a bunch, you know, um, you might not even get them. Right. And, and at the end of the day, too, is, you know, I ask that because, again, it's a microbial uh, testing. A lot of states, you know, I don't know just top of my head. That's the first time I hear anything. We need you put something on flyer. I'm like, well, can it pass state testing? Uh, yes, that's I don't, a good point. I don't point. know if that would throw anything off as well. It very well could be. I mean, and you have different every every prov <laughs> province, every like part <laughs> of different states, you know, are, are necessarily going to have different regulations. Even so, um, it can be very difficult to track that. And um, I think it's a very important point to make. I don't have an answer for it, and I don't think anyone does still still new and looking into it particularly when it comes to cannabis again it's it's a well-known plant now but it's a very unknown in the realms of academia uh in a lot of these uh researches or <laughs> researches that's a good word um the studies that can be done uh all right so so moving back to kind of like the practical how does this affect me the home grower uh maybe you got some plants outside i know a lot of people were excited for this because yes uh they they know this one probably the best thing to do right now is because it all starts when the moth comes and lays its eggs on your plants right is that kind of the beginning of the problem Yes, so, I would say that's the that's the proximate beginning of the problem. Okay. Egg is egg is on plant, and now larva later on. Okay, so we can we can try to you know wrap that plant up uh, by using the netting, and that prevents kind of the transmission from the from the moth to the plant as far as the eggs go. Absolutely. Is, so okay. Is there a particular, like, you know, hash makers, we all talk microns, but is there a particular sized net that you would need to prevent these moths? Or is it just a common generic bug net? Oh, it's a good point. And I think I mentioned it in um, other series for different pests. So, like, uh, it's often for, for smaller pests, like thrips, for example, there's mesh uh, that's literally called a thrips screen because they're so dang small. Yeah. Um, and so I don't remember the micron on the top of my head, but if you look that up, you can find the answer to that question. But for the moths, they get quite large. So you probably don't really need that. And one of the, one of the, so one of the disadvantages of a very small mesh um, pore size is that um, air also doesn't move very well through it as well. Mm -hmm. So okay. you could run into this problem where um, the, uh, the airflow is kind of restricted somewhat 
so that could be a problem if you're in a place where you're more likely to have like a fungal pathogen or something like botrytis, which would be a different kind of bud problem. Yeah, that that's good to know. Uh, you know, every everything you hear about on TV as far as uh, medicines comes with side effects. And this may be an unintended, unintended side effect of like, yeah, I'm getting those moss this year. Consider your humidity, consider your airflow, and I guess the overall size of the hole. So that's an excellent, excellent little tidbit there. Yeah, and it's also important that you do it right. I worked with um, I worked with some growers who, to combat the airflow, this was in um, cannabis, but also they were growing um, other plants as well. Um, they bowed out the the netting, so instead of it being like a box, a straight box, they like they made a curve, um, and so then there's more surface area for the air to move okay. through, and so that could be uh, an advantage potentially. And, and you mentioned, you know, again, two of the three were prevalent in North America for those farmers here. You know, again, I hear California farmers a lot talking about budworms. Um, you said July, August, you tend to see them, but June as well. Is it too late to get started with the screens already? Or what stage are we at as far as identification or prevention in most areas? I would say, well, like... I would say that uh, at this point, they're, they're already budworm moths active in most, pla okay. most places, but it's probably not, or in many places, I should say, but it's probably not at the peak yet. So mm -hmm. you, I think you have time to prepare, absolutely. Okay. And um, a question that came in from Peter, we were talking earlier about as the larva progresses, they eat a lot more uh, exponentially. And we, we got into golf ball size surface areas. Was yes. that uh, a statistic per day? Like, or per week? No, it's total. That they eat or... Total. If okay. Remember, if I remember correctly, per stage. So if I remember okay. correctly, per stage. The research, okay. The research report, right. So, um, the research report that I was citing that information from was for a uh, different species, but a lot of caterpillars kind of work this way, right? Cause like, they're basically just a fat sack of, <laughs> of guts of fat and protein. Um, and they get that way cause they eat a ton. And so yeah. when they're small, they only need a little bit, but when they get larger and larger and larger, they need exponentially more food. And so the problem you run into is that, the moth like lays like 500 eggs across your crop and like they all, all they all eat collectively a very little bit a very little bit and then they get to that stage where they like exponentially grow it all happens at once and decimates your plants right it went but from it, like it's, eh, it's not so bad i'll get it tomorrow to like should have got it yesterday yeah basically and they're uh and yeah it's probably life stage i believe if i remember correctly but you can check the research if you're curious and again, you put a lot of the citations, the kind of color coded from the comment up top to the citation at the bottom. Uh, everybody can find that research here and saw a good comment. We're getting a lot of good comments today. Um, Hawaii sustainable though, commercial uh, scale row covers, Johnny seeds catalog. I know a lot of us probably order our, our normal seeds from there. Sounds like one place that you could get a row cover if you've got a lot to manage with outside. Um, and, you know, again, I, I'm glad Peter asked that surface area question because that, that's all I was thinking when you're saying that. I'm just, you know, this little thing eating so much. I'm like, I think it's just got to blow up like a blimp. It's got to <laughs> poop all over the place. But I have had, and this is when I had uh, my grow room in a garage. I actually did get some type of worm, but it was the poop that tipped me off. So... Can you maybe talk about that as far as like an identifying feature? Because I saw the poop before I saw any damage and then that caused me to look uh, further and investigate and confirm what I suspected. Yeah, so like I usually see, I mean, this is going to be less um, obvious for the budworms because they're like sheltered in your bud, but not always. And you can kind of see the damage sometimes on the buds and like Peter mentions in the chat um they are the eggs are often deposited early in the flower not always but depends on when you're growing really um and when they're active but what will happen is that um in other similar species like uh, the cabbage looper which is really common also a noctuid 
um, you know, they eat a ton and it's, and you mentioned them blowing up. That's actually kind of the point. They're trying to eat so much, you know, they eat so much, they eat so much and they have all this nutrient that they can, and, and size like volume, they just kind of, they, they bust out into the next stage, but they have to make copious amounts of waste to process all of it. And so what will happen is that uh, they'll, they'll, if they expose, if they eat exposed, then yeah, they'll eat a bunch of leaf matter and then they'll just be, uh, making all kinds of waste right below them. And so that can be really helpful for crop scouting, uh, especially because they might want to be like under the leaf or kind of be a little bit sheltered. So when you do your crop scouting, you really should be looking um, under the leaves, around the branches, at the, the flowers themselves, really inspecting, because you'll see those uh, helpful markers. And, and that was a good point you kind of just mentioned too. you know, look all around, look up, because that was one thing. It's like, I saw it on a leaf down here but I know it didn't come from below that level. So I kind of looked up, looked at the bud and, uh, before, I mean, long, long ago, my, the, the first time when I was living in, uh, Northern California, that was my introduction to Northern California outdoor. And there were a couple of times, you know, early in the season where we got these buds and there'd be little tunnels through the bud. Now it hadn't rotted or there wasn't any like, discernible damage other than just this perfect little tunnel it was so perfect i'm like oh that'd be funny you stick a sting string through it you could wear it as a necklace <laughs> um it didn't take much many more bags or longer to actually find a worm and then connect the dots to what caused those tunnels um but that's something that you know you you, you do see and when you see it, it it's kind of amazing the extent of damage that they can and will do like you said they're not necessarily hanging out at the end they'll go right in and that's where the and that's where the uh a lot of the bud rock comes from is that correct is kind of that that tunnel uh do they leave any kind of mucus that antagonizes the uh the bud rot or is it just moisture and different microclimate yeah I, I, that's a good question i think that it's mainly just that uh they cause all this like damage just from feeding and also their waste, they're not really worried about where it goes. So, <laughs> so the, the waste might be, might rot, you know, the, the, mm, the wounds okay. that they produce will, will uh, be exacerbated. And um, I think that's where that often happens. And, you know, sometimes they might vector, uh, there's no mucus, but they might vector pathogens um, that are already in their gut. I use the word pathogen loosely, I should really say like a, an opportunistic microbe you know, that might colonize the wound. Okay. I've got to see here. Uh, Peter, he, he, he just typed in what he's doing. He says he's ready this year. And I honestly, I'm like, man, you need to call Home Depot and sell this as a kit right now. But small <laughs> PVC hoop house, mosquito netting, bug zapper for night, BT, scout and pick them off. So, and he also mentioned earlier that he had a lot of tobacco around. So that, that kind of piqued his interest when you were talking about uh, the tobacco corn or, or earworm. Ear, yeah. Tobacco, tobacco budworm. Yes. Yeah, the names Thank are. The, the, yeah, no, I, 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 def, I did that several times uh, presenting for this or practicing for this presentation because uh, it's a tongue twister. <laughs> yes. And uh, Mike Jackson here. Yeah, um, little poppy seeds. That's kind of what I saw as well. Uh, Matthew, you're saying that it might differ uh, based on kind of different types of worms, or is that just a, you know, a good generalization for what their, what their poop's going to look like? Well, it depends on your definition of little. I would say that uh, in my experience, when, when the larvae get to like their third, you know, third or fourth stage, um, and also for other noctuids for that matter, I would say the the waist, the little pellets can be kind of big, okay. uh, maybe the size of their head. Uh, I don't really have a good reference point for that, but like, um, but uh, tip of they, a pen or something. Yeah, uh, more like um, I have nothing good here, but like it can it can be kind of significant because what they do many pellets. So I've seen right. like um, I, I've seen it be kind of like gross. Like you don't want to. <laughs> like not sal like like a, a not salvageable amount of waste has been don't applied. don't don't taste it and see what that thing yeah. is what's this <laughs> no. okay and and this is just kind of a a fun question here but 
What about the fuzzy caterpillars? We didn't see any fuzzy caterpillars. Does fuzzy mean they're good? Or does fuzzy bad too? Fu you know, fuzzy... Uh, fuzzy doesn't mean much, necessarily. It could be that okay. the hairs are um, toxic. It could be that they're irritating. Um, it could just be a little defense mechanism. There's all kinds of fuzzy caterpillars out there, but uh, yeah. Okay. And, and one thing I, w I wanted to kind of get back to, I guess I skipped ahead there. Um, we were talking about tobacco and the other crops and you know he was concerned that hey i've got something else that they like they may come to my yard uh, but one thing you mentioned in the presentation too was a very popular cover crop crimson clover uh yes. other clovers um so that was kind of a, a golden nugget there for people to consider i know uh we discussed uh, the clover also kind of attracts aphids doesn't it i would say there are aphids that go after clover Okay, okay, because there there were a couple reasons why we're like, eh, you know, it was it was great four or five years ago, crimson clover, cover crop with it, but th this if this were a particular issue, it might make it fall out of favor, I would guess. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, I don't think it's necessarily always bad. It really just depends on your context. But um, when I think of clover, I, the pest that comes to my mind is actually um, spider mites. Uh, usually okay. doesn't mean that they'll be especially attracted, but like uh, spider mites are really small and, you know, kind of like the caterpillars, they could, you know, kind of eke out an existence, build up a population. And suddenly they're everywhere. Yeah. Don't let them get out of hand. So one of those video slides you showed made me, made me seriously go, Ugh. but uh, I guess uh, with the BT and with the, the budworms that we're concerned about, is there a particular frequency that we need to apply um, every three days, once a week? Uh, is it based on infestation or is there a generally accepted regimen for applying BT? Oh, I would say that that is another one of those really contextual questions that is mostly mediated by what you're seeing in your traps. And that's why, um, that's why Dr. Crenshaw was so uh, adamant about screening appropriately and um, and having those traps and shaking them often. Um, I would say that it would not be unheard of to have to apply more than once a week, possibly twice a week, um, especially when you're at that like peak over position period when the adults are all very active. I also want to um, answer uh, Steve Reisner's question, potent ponics, that Indeed, the, the hybrids are usually harder to treat because they have more resistance factors, um, environmental and also chemical and biological. Are you getting that from chat? Uh, yes. Oh, here we go. Here he is. Okay. Sorry. I, uh, I always like to get him up, and I, know, I definitely know <laughs> Steve's potent ponic, so I'm like, well, I don't see him in here. There we go. Okay. Uh, done any of the oh, wild... wild bt harvesting so like getting some bt from Whoa. the gut that's interesting i um i've heard of people doing that as well not necessarily in this context uh but it's the kind of thing you know it's exactly that kind of cool sort of scientific understanding of the microbes that as people become more and more knowledgeable you could exploit things like that like oh i found a strain that works really well and I cataloged it, and now I can share it with people or something. Like, I love that kind of stuff. My, my uh, rudimentary mind goes to, you know, harvesting from the caterpillar guts. See a little caterpillar on an operating table with a little scalpel. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know how you would go about doing that, but uh, I'm sure really smart people do. So we'll yeah. leave that there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and let's see here. I got just a couple more here. So everybody in chat, if you have some questions, again, definitely toss them up there. Uh, me and Matthew will get them on the screen and get them answered for you. Um, I have a point. Wait, Peter mentioned, please make it. Yeah, Peter mentioned the bug zappers at night, and yes. I want to say that uh, um, that could be a double-edged sword because... The way that they work is that they usually, usually they um, have a UV light, 
and UV is very attractive to many insects. Some of them are beneficial, which you might kill, um, unfortunately, through using the trap, which is not great. But also you might attract more <laughs> of, the, of the moths, you okay. know, so, so that right. could be a benefit because you kill them, but also might get them close enough and then they might not get to the trap for whatever reason. So just be, just consider that that is a, a alternative result. Sounds like a double-edged sword there. Double-edged sword for sure. Um, and uh, earlier you mentioned that the pupae go into the soil. Um, how long do they last in the soil? And is that something that you can almost skim a layer off or look for without uh, disrupting it too much? Oh, that's a really cool question. I think, so usually there's several centimeters, like I've seen pictures and I, I omitted them in the, in the slide, in the presentation, because I thought it was getting too big and too complex, but um, usually they tunnel several centimeters vertical or sometimes it's sort of a narrow channel and then they make like a chamber. Um, I mentioned uh, pupae killing tillage. It's kind of hard to tell where they've come. They're not like gophers. You can't like see the hole very well. Um, right. I think that's not very difficult to achieve, uh, okay. sort of looking for them in that way. Cause yeah, I, I mean, I've accidentally stumbled on them in the garden, just doing, you know, basic weeding and whatnot maintenance. Uh, just kind of like, Oh, look, look this thing, I don't have a pine tree around here. Why is this pine? Th oh, it's not one of those. Yeah. So that's what it looked like to me there. Um, and, you know, crop risk, this is kind of off cannabis, uh, but still on the subject, too. Uh, you know, the cotton boll worm, you said, hasn't really made its way to this country. Uh, as we've seen in the past uh, with crop, insects, animals, whatever, it, it'll eventually make its way here. What crop is it going to attack uh, first? And what kind of, you know, like percentage should we expect to lose again? Is this something that would like all of a sudden we have no wheat? Is this like a food scarcity concern or that's always of interest to me, especially lately. Me too. Um, so that's a, that's a question I probably can't answer. I don't know if anyone could totally answer that question, but if we base right. it off of some of the crops that they've already, that they already go after in like Eurasia and Africa and such, um, you know, cotton is a big one. It's even named for it. Um, t tomato is a big one. And in Brazil, it's been it's been incredibly destructive against uh, various food crops. So not just like crops you would use a harvest for textiles, but um, specifically food crops. And tomato is a big one. Um, and I mentioned a few others on the presentation, actually. So if anyone's curious, they could check that out uh, on the list. But yeah, um, it would probably go after a lot of a lot of different agricultural resources. Okay. And, and I do want to mention too, you know, again, you were talking about this is a good time for some of the other ones in North America, where a lot of the audience is uh, to get started. It's kind of already there. You had some things to start with, but also if people going back watching this, if you go back to an hour and three minutes, uh, there's an example IPM plan there, which would be great to follow. Uh, any advice is good advice and like other forms of IPM, the more the merrier. So multiple, uh, multiple ways to kind of deal with this one. Uh, because again, it, it is something that outdoor growers deal with. It is something that you should expect to lose almost, you know, X amount, uh, percentage of plants or harvest each year due to it. Uh, just kind of, does it almost kind of seem like the cost of doing business outdoors in some of these locales? Yeah, pretty much. Um, whether you like it or not, I, like I said, I drenched myself in research for this presentation and it was very edifying to come across the literature about, especially like Central and South America. Um, the, so like very good question you had about the North American potential for some of these um, that are coming in like the cotton bullworm and just the way that just like, even within the first year or two, it, it, it topped the list of pests for certain agricultural pests. And so, oh, wow. um, yeah, it's just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned. <laughs> wow, we have it... pretty good, 
biosecurity system here in North America. So hopefully we can work together. Yes, yes, we'll we'll keep that on. And you know, kind of one of the the hard things about controlling them. And you had a, a slide up there. It was you know, it almost looked like a matrix of different colors, but they have that built in natural ability to neutralize plant defenses. We talk about terpenes a lot in cannabis and, you know, sometimes you can get more terpenes by stressing it with insect presence because it's a natural insecticide. That doesn't work though with, with the budworms. Not as much. Yeah. Um, there are some compounds that, I mean, like, uh, even with the insecticides we use that are like plant-based, um, you know, the dose makes the poison, right? So what we're really relying on is overwhelming the system uh, with whatever compound we're using. So, and in this case, like they're just very, very good at getting through it. Um, mm -hmm. And then they also have the shelter too. So it's like a double whammy. Wow. And uh, here, you know, uh, potent ponics, he, he's, consulted on on many consonants he's been to africa and yeah bullworm sucks so don't bring him back with you buddy leave him <laughs> there please check your shoes <laughs> check your yeah, shoes seriously your uh, yeah seriously yeah that is they'll be intense the i i uh especially in africa is this uh, is the cotton bullworm is some is very difficult to deal with um yeah anyways Okay, uh, moving on. I guess there's just a couple more that I had here. Um, <clears throat> you actually answered a lot of them in the presentation, which was awesome. <laughs> LOL. Wash my dreads before I come back. See, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Watch your... I, I, no joke, though. The, uh, the Japanese maple, again, I'll reference that outside. I said, you know, I had little larva. They were stringing down. I walked under it. I brushed against it. And I'm like, am I bringing one of those in my hair into the house? That's... That's real IPM stuff right there, people. <laughs> True. Always be thinking. Um, and then I guess the, the, the question here I had here is it, you kind of touched on it. <clears throat> um, that color isn't really an identifying factor. So if you had somebody in a forum being like, well, earwor budworms are always brown. So if it's brown, that's what you have. Um, more of an identifying factor, not necessarily narrowing it down to a specific type. But does color give you an indicator of the potential damage level? Kind of like snakes, you know, bright colors, more venomous. Uh, does that same logic apply here to the color of the larva? Uh, if it does, I'm not aware of anything like that. I don't think <laughs> that it does, though, because um, they're so they're so what's called polymorphic. So they just have a ton of different colors and forms, and that's just how it is. Okay, just checking. So yeah, they they hit the full range. They're a butterfly. Okay, the crystal the crystal is of color. Uh, well, cool, man. I look like we've kind of hit a lot of the questions that we had here. Um, yeah, I like this comment. The greener they are, the more they've eaten. <laughs> <laughs> uh jokes 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 it's good stuff well okay so cool let's let's kind of um i guess we'll wrap it up please let people know how they can get a hold of you where maybe they can find some more of your work i know i've got some of these in the show notes as well for people but i'd love to hear it from you too matthew where can people find more uh, of what you're doing absolutely so a few different places again for professional inquiries interested in me helping you train your staff to know about what pests are and what they aren't beneficials and how to use them and that kind of stuff as well as just an on-site evaluation or a remote consultation you can come across me at xenthanol.com i also interact with people on social media as well my instagram and twitter is at sync angel where i share a lot of my research and video content including the presentations we do here as well as live streams on occasion as well. So you can ask me questions there, or um, if you have a professional inquiry, you can also contact me there too if you need to. And um, I also have a Patreon, over 100 people on my Patreon Discord channel. So if you're interested in getting quick, uh, easy questions about IPM from me or some of the other very talented people who have been learning on the Discord or already know themselves, you can check me out 
at patreon.com slash sentinel. If you subscribe for as little as $1 a month, uh, you can get access to the Discord channel, and we can have uh, more detailed conversations and things like that. You can share pictures and video. So very uh, excited to be able to help people through that medium because it's a lot harder than going or easier than going through like hundreds of messages online. Oh, definitely. And I, I am definitely a proud Patreon supporter there. Uh, and again, once I once I nail down the Japanese maple, I keep mentioning, <laughs> I'll be <laughs> I'll be cashing in on my my question. Please tell me how to do this. <laughs> uh, so that's and and you also uh, YouTube. I've got YouTube in here. Uh, oh, how did I forget? Com channel. YouTube.com Zenthanol. That's where I make most of my uh, most. Um, in my opinion, most proudest science communication educational videos, like my pest primer series, which is actually very similar to this Sentinel IPM series. It goes over pests, but in shorter bits. Cool, digestible. And you can always chop these up too, but hey, these are fun to rewatch. A lot of times, you know, I put them on uh, as background. Sometimes there's a lot, and this goes for all shows, there's a lot to absorb. Uh, so the more I listen to it, the more I catch each time. And that's a great way to try to learn, you know, digestible. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day. They're like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. I like that. <laughs> yep. So we are probably going to be back again in the near future. Um, everybody, topics that you'd like to see uh, Matthew cover, definitely uh, get at him through the messages or better yet, even leave them in the comments here. Uh, then we could all check them and we could get some feedback. Any idea of what we may be seeing in the future or when we'll uh, be back here, Matthew? I'm not totally sure. I do know that Peter requested some filings. I think other people have also, I know other people have asked me about them as well. So I don't know if it'll be the next one we do, but it's definitely one we'll do very soon. So, uh, but if you guys know which ones you want, please comment. Cause I do look at the comments for questions and to see what people want to see. So if you have a pest you really want us to check, check that we haven't already done it and then give us a comment. Awesome, that's perfect. And hey man, it was great to be back. Thank you for being here. And again, coming with another killer presentation and allowing me to uh, get back behind the desk. We'll have uh, some more stuff coming up. Ooh, the, 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 you definitely brought the porn bots out today. I will say that much. Uh, so <laughs> let me put that person on block real quick. But uh, yeah, and as I was saying earlier in chat, it's because it's such a damn sexy topic. They, uh, they knew they had to come. <laughs> Uh, but okay, so enough with them. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, I'll be back. I'll be starting uh, another uh, weekly show this time uh, on Saturdays. That'll be fun. Uh, it is the Friendly Cannabis Show, hosted by Chad Westport. So <laughs> there you go. That's the sneak peek. And for today, we will wrap. Everybody, thanks again for joining us. We certainly appreciate you being here. Uh, even you porn bots, because you make us laugh. So until next time, <laughs> thank you very much, Matthew. We'll see everybody again.